Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, July 15, 2021. This is the week in charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for being here, especially since I haven't advertised it much as of late. If you're watching a recording of this, you could go to daylander.com slash webinar. And even if the show is saying it's an older show, you can register and you'll be registered for all the shows for the next couple of years. So we talk about, well, obviously current market conditions. Geez, I'm gonna have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, hold off into the live charts when we get to the stock picks. And if you don't mind, keep your questions to the slides or relative to the slides, so my ADD doesn't kick in. And once we get to the live charts, ask about as many stocks as you want, just put in one at a time, and you can ask about anything you want then too. So this week's focus is a bunch of trading stuff, and that's gonna make a lot of sense in just one minute. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as often summing up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I, I'm not a huge fan of watching TV, but my wife is. <laughs> and we end up binge watching a lot of things. And I used to just pull out a laptop and start working. And in more recent times, I've been enjoying binge watching some things with my wife. And that's kind of our family time together, so to speak. And it's, it's some pretty good stuff out there. And after going, I tried to watch Yellowstone a couple of years ago. And I just couldn't get past, you know, whiny Kevin Costner. And it's probably because of Dances with Wolves. And I saw a comedian make fun of him once. and. That was like one of the most painful movies ever. Listen to Kevin Costner whine for four hours. But anyway, Yellowstone actually turned out to be pretty cool and, and he didn't whine too much. And one thing I do, and, and maybe it's a sickness, but I, I look at little details in the show. And I noticed that this cowboy here had on a shirt that said, been doing cowboy shit all day. And it's like, you know, boy, I, I, I do miss a little bit of the country days when a neighbor would call me over to help with them some wrangling stuff and i had to pull a, a, a cow out once and and things like that a lot of fun so i miss that cowboy stuff a little bit not much but a little bit <laughs> but i've been thinking like lately it's been so crazy in the markets there's so much trading shit i want to talk about and by the way it's kind of interesting and i did a little research on this guy this guy actually created the show and he just did a little cameo appearance anyway when i woke up I wrote like a whole uh, page of what I want to cover today. And then, of course, my super high speed internet went out. So I had to go on backup. And then the market was just ludicrous again today. Even ludicrous would say it was ludicrous, like it was yesterday. So I'm going to cover a lot of this, but there's a lot more stuff I want to cover in upcoming weeks, is what I'm trying to say. Now, Someone started the service recently, and within about a week or two, they quit, and I asked for feedback, and this gentleman was kind enough to give me some feedback. And he said he back-tested it for a few months, June through October 2020, and was disappointed in results. The month looked at did not appear, the months I looked at did not appear to be that difficult in terms of volatility or tradability. I enjoyed the material, especially trading psychology, although it seemed repetitious at times. I do beat a dead horse. That's a different conversation altogether. I am curious. You obviously have a history of your trade recommendations. Do you have a history of results? Well, before we get into some of that, the first thing I did was I pulled up the chart from last year and I'm like, oh shoot. Yeah, it's kind of a big blue arrow. I, I suppose you could draw and then I got to thinking about it and says, well, wait a minute. He said June through October. And when I plotted that period, it looked a little bit more different. Now, the market on a net-net basis, on a closing basis, was up 7%. But it went up, it went down, it went up, it went down. And then it finally had a decent trend, and then it began to implode. Then it went up and then it went down again. And even though it went up 7%, there were a heck of a lot of zigs and zags 
during that period. And one thing I did notice that was kind of interesting is if he would have started his analysis just a few days later, he would have noticed that the market only went up no percent, at least from the high to the low, it was actually zero percent. And what is that, June, July, August, September, October, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, five months. So on a net net basis, at least from the June high to the end of October, it made 0% move. Now, and I'm gonna flesh this out in just one second, but it's hard to make money as a trend follower when the market's going up, going down, market going up, going down. What has to happen is it has to persist in its trend. So right around here, you start getting long, more than likely. And then you can see we had this sharp reversal and it was a big enough reversal to where you would start shorting. And then of course, went straight back up again, and then it went straight back down. So that's not an easy period to trade. And, and what I replied to this gentleman was, I'd like to see what some other trend followers did, provided of course, they were true to form and not try to somebody that did reverse to the mean trading or something, which they probably would have gotten rewarded for, except for one little spanking possibly in between. Now, just getting back to the results real quick, my official policy is I don't publish official results. And one reason, there's a whole bunch of reasons why, but one reason is the discretion, a little bit of discretion makes the service work a heck of a lot better. And I'm not talking about every day, all day. It might be only once a quarter where you have a near miss on a profit target, maybe twice a quarter on occasion, especially on a near miss. You might have a stop, a stop nick or an opening gap reversal. And with just, just a tiny bit of experience and maybe setting alerts to let you know when these things are getting close and possibly an alert as opposed to a stop, provided, of course, you would have time to put a stop in afterwards for a stop, Nick, you could certainly improve the performance. And as I'll say in one second, I also don't do any compounded just to keep the math easy. The count is always 100 grand, whether or not, hypothetical 100 grand, whether or not the portfolio is underwater or not, or recent trades are underwater or not. And if things are going really well, I don't compound higher. And I'll flesh that out in just a minute now one thing that i, I want to kind of touch upon tonight is that i kind of see it as more than just a tip sheet and i think that everyone here understands what i'm saying but to those who are new to it just keep in mind that there's a lot more to it than just the official recommendations anyway there's a, a fact page i don't want to bore you too much i know too late with all this but there's a fact page on my website that has all of those things spelled out in a lot more detail. Now, looking at that period, I went in and looked at all the closed trades and added in mark to markets. And unfortunately, the mark to markets in early June, within like the first day or so, were uh, fairly ugly based on where the stocks in the old portfolios portfolio was marked. And the service, not surprisingly, did not do so well. And in fact, this gentleman is right. It was down 9.1%. And you look at the market, well, the market was up 7%, Dave, what's wrong with you? Well, what's wrong with me was the market didn't go up in a straight line. It was all over the place. And there was a lot of jockey for position to get position. Now, here's the good news as far as the jockeying for position. If you would have checked in a week or two later, maybe a few weeks, I forget exactly when, one of the open trades, CRSR, which I marked to market at the end of October, stopped out for an additional gain of 54.81. And that's on the second loaf of that trade. So that goes a long ways towards getting you back into black. So, I know I don't publish official results and for a variety of reasons. It, one is the past is not the future. You can see this chart looks okay, doesn't look so great from June to October, but over a year's year period of time from June to June, it looks pretty darn good. Well, hey Dave, could I expect to make 40 something percent next year? Um, I don't know, probably not, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I hope to make 100% 
from June to June or a thousand percent. That's what I'm aiming for. But I wouldn't be too upset with 42 percent, especially with no discretion and just following things mechanically and also no compounding. Now, let me just kind of unpack that a little bit. The reason we follow things or I follow things in the spreadsheet mechanically, even though I apply discretion, is just to make the math easy and so people can understand. For instance, I'm trying to think of which one. I think I stopped out of Simar today, which, which was one we've been in for a while. It got stopped out not that long ago. And I, there's a couple of more that come to mind that I use a little discretion on. And sometimes a little discretion really, really works, and sometimes it doesn't. But the one time that it really, really works can make all the difference in the world. And as I alluded to earlier, there's no compounding. Now, compounding, obviously, on the way down, you would be trading fewer and fewer shares, so your drawdown wouldn't be as bad. And once the market began to rally, you would be trading more and more and more shares that look better and better. Unfortunately, like everything, that cuts both ways. But I'd be willing to bet if you compound it, especially with this nice little equity curve in here, it would be much, much better. Now, one thing to remember is the mark to markets of the open portfolio did kind of accelerate this higher. It would probably be a little bit smoother equity curve if I were to smooth out the mark to markets, not to uh, to June, okay, to the beginning of June. It would probably look a little bit better. So what happened, what I'm trying to say is I went in and there were mark to markets that were done, obviously going back to October, but then from then forward, the mark to markets were just with the recent June portfolio. So this is kind of exacerbated. This is These are actual numbers as far as following mechanically, but it's kind of exacerbated. It didn't jump this much overnight. It's, it was more of a gradual climb higher. And I just don't have the time to go in and, and smooth that out for you guys. And if somebody wanted to, that would be fantastic. But I don't think you have to. You kind of get the idea or the point I'm trying to make here is it's very difficult to look at just one period with any methodology, not just my methodology. What you want to do is look over a period of time. And ideally, you want to look at a bear market, a bull market, and some choppy periods in between. And I've tried, believe me, everything under the sun. If you name a methodology, I'd be willing to say that I tried it and probably lost a lot of money trying it. This is the best that I found after many years of searching this hybrid approach where we're looking to take a swing trade profit off and stick around longer term. And we have some positions, believe it or not, that were put on last July, I think, at least one, and quite a few that were put on last fall. And hopefully, I know I just said hope, Hopefully, we can su survive this little correction we're going through, and that's something I don't want to talk about, too. And we're with some of these positions next year, and next July, and next August, September, and so on and so forth. The Facebook page is a forum of discretion and can help from peers. Most of the time, the Facebook, most of the Facebook crowd crowd did quite well last year. I was at 27%. Yeah, 27% is is fantastic. I mean, if that's if I get 27%, I I would not be complaining. Obviously, I want to try to knock it out the park and I want a triple digit year, but 27% is nothing to sneeze at. In fact, if you can make 20% a year and compound that, you would own the world pretty quickly. And if you get bored, do the math on that. It works out pretty nicely. I think your account doubles every few years and just, you know, you only have to be around for a few years to have that happen and do exceptionally well. Now, a couple of thoughts in looking at all this. Compounding would obviously help, okay? And and I think compounding would, even though it can cut both ways, as you saw in the chart, we had that period where we're just kind of grinding it out, grinding it out, wondering if this stuff is ever going to work. And all of a sudden, bam, it starts working. But if you could trade maybe smaller size, because obviously your account's going down during that period, and then start to step on the gas a little bit, not throw caution to the wind, you're still trading at 2%. And 
and believe me, it 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 is kind of hard. And, and I've had a lot of clients over the year tell me that Dave, you know, my account's a little bit bigger, and at two percent, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big number. And I have some accounts split up to where they're small enough to where I could I could stomach the losses in in the account. But the accounts that have grown a little bit, that two percent is is quite a big spanking. And and I I, I took that spanking on a few of these positions this week and it, it's not it's not easy but over time if you can catch these nice momentum periods especially with the compounding you'll do exceptionally well now like i said a minute ago discretion helps considerably i guess i should put can help considerably there wasn't a tremendous amount of discretion going back i'll have to go in and look at it in a little detail but there was some here and there, and I actually pulled up some of the trades where in the side of my, my own personal tracking spreadsheet, I'll put uh, stop nick or ogre for open a gap reversal. Let's say something gaps below the stop and then comes back up. Well, in a case like that, I would stick with the position. And I actually went in, and some of them I didn't, I didn't exactly print money, but instead of losing $2,000 on a 100K account, on an account that I trade similar to the model, which I use for all my analysis as far as like the education is concerned that you're getting here tonight and that I preach and teach. I, on one of them, I think it was, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but it was one that we lost 2000 on mechanically, but somehow I was able to break even. Not that a grand poobah, not that I always do as well. Sometimes I do worse, but it's just an example of discretion. And I went and looked at two or three of these discretionary calls and Luckily, I saw where I was able to do a little better. And there's nothing secret about it, this discretion. We actually, as Craig was just generous enough to say, we actually talk about these things when a little discretion is needed. And I'll even pop in to the Facebook group and say, hey, guys, you know, this is a stop, Nick. Let's see if we can hang on. Or this is a near miss on a profit target. And that's one of the most frustrating things is to have something get really close to a profit target and not quite get there. And then you split hairs and not take profits. So little, just a few little things. And, and I, I kind of talk about these things over and over again. One place to, to get a lot of this, if you're a little newer to the methodology, would be to go through the Q&A. And we talk a lot about discretion in there because I get a lot of questions on that. And I've answered those. But then in more recent times, we haven't done any Q&As in a while, as you know, because the Facebook group has been taking care of all that. Anyway. So just ask in Facebook if you have any issues. And to my surprise, you guys are really, you know, taking the ball and ran with it as far as answering the questions and doing a good job. So I appreciate, I really appreciate you guys helping out the other guys. When I started this group, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'll just be sitting there all day answering questions or whatever, Grand Puba, you know, blah, blah, blah. But you guys have really done a fantastic job. So I thank you for that. As I alluded to a minute ago, trends must follow through in order to profit from them. As Greg Morris once said, in order to make money in a trend, you must first have a trend to make money. <laughs> so, and then follow through is a killer. And on the short side, it's really tricky because markets look like they're rolling over, getting ready to tank. And if you don't pile on, or at least put on a few shorts, at the first little sign of the market beginning to crack, and that market does crack, you're going to miss the crux of the downside. However, if it goes straight back up, like you saw earlier in the earlier slide, then obviously you would lose money on that trade. So if you go back during that period, I don't remember exactly how many they were, but there were a few shorts that did not work. You could, if you took those out, I know it's all hypothetical, but if you took them out hypothetically, things would look a lot better. But you could see by looking at those, you could see where and why I began to put them on. But unfortunately, the trend didn't materialize. Or fortunately, if you want to look at it that way, as I often say, if we start putting on shorts and we get stopped out of all of them and the market goes straight up, that's fine with me because we'll just make money on the long side. I'd rather do that anyway. As I think I said earlier, it could take six to eight months. And that's, that's a tough kind of a tough pill to swallow. That's a long time to believe in something, right? And, and believe me, I get beat up too, and I wonder too, and you know, I felt like God last couple of weeks until 
from Friday to now when things started to get whacked a little bit or a lot of it. But it can take six to eight months and occasionally a little longer. If you go in and look at that June to July period, that was about five months of underperformance. But then over the next few months, knock on wood, thank God, we began to capture that momentum cycle again and things begin to work out nicely. Now, a few big outliers can make all the difference in the world. And that's one of the pitfalls of trend following. I don't know if I, I think I wrote an article back when I was doing a lot more random thoughts, why trend following is hard. And I'm also, I also have a, an article in my head, the pitfalls of trend following. So the big outliers or one of the pitfalls, also an opportunity too, right? But you have to catch an occasional outlier for the most part. You can have a period of time where everything sort of works. It works really well. And then other times, it's very important that you capture the occasional outlier. And that's why we keep chipping away at it, chipping away at it, chipping away at it. Every now and then, we get something that goes up 600%. I'll show you how that's actually a good problem, obviously, but a problem nonetheless to have. So a few outliers are important. As I said many times before, when I said one good streaky, I think I meant to say one good streaky period, or one good streak, can make your year. And that's when you get into a print money phase where everything you touch is just making a lot of money, or you're hitting quite a few of those, and I make it sound elusive because sometimes it is, outliers and, and i've told the story a thousand times but just a long story endless peter mothy once invited me to speak to a group in dallas and after the speech he gave me some constructive criticism he said use the word streaky you're making it again this is word elusive you're making it sound a little too elusive and i thought to myself well that it is streaky and it can be streaky and most people give up now two weeks is not nearly enough time to look at something unless you're looking at the old portfolio and say, okay, well, maybe this guy can do this again. Let's see. But you do have to give it time and that, that goes for any methodology, but obviously I'm focusing on my stuff. Now, as I alluded to a second ago, a good problem to have is when you get in a, in a stock at lower levels, and you take your partial profits and you trail that stop loosely, then all of a sudden the position becomes quite sizable. So if you look back here, when we got into CPE, a 10% move was roughly, let's say a dollar, round numbers, and one dollar times 500 shares, this is after you hit the initial profit target, is, or a 10% move, so your account will go up and down $500 per 100K on a 10% move. Well, recently, when I was updating the spreadsheet and quite frankly, looking at my equity all day long, <laughs> that same 10% move is now six points and on a 500 share remainder position, six times five obviously is 35. So that's a 3,500 dollar swing in let's say a 100k account okay just to keep the math easy well regardless of what size your account is if you're trading at proper size those leftover shares would have gone from a half a percent swing on your account on a 10 percent move to a three and a half percent swing on a 10 percent move now your initial margin that you put up is the same your margin doesn't go up right but your percent of the portfolio in a position goes up so what's 500 times that's like twenty thousand thirty thousand dollars in this position which was started with with much much less money so you you have more and more percentage wise of a stock in your portfolio what i recommend you do is if you come in and this thing is up two or three or four points a day, maybe put in a trailing stop on uh, even like 100 shares, okay? And just peel off a little bit 
of those shares. So if it's up around 50 bucks a share or so, and you trail a stop intraday and peel off those shares by the end of the day, let's say 100 shares, well, you've taken $5,000 at around 50 bucks, right? You've taken that off the table and you're smooth out those equity swings. Now, unfortunately, if the stock continues to run higher, you're going to not obviously make as much money longer term, but you might be able to sleep a little easier at night if you sort of have lightened up during the trend a little bit. I'm not saying dump your entire position, but maybe peel off a couple hundred shares or so to where you're, you don't have quite as much exposure. And that only matters, obviously, when the stock begins to tank or if the overall market begins to tank, kind of like right now. All right, I want to touch upon some Russian dolls, and I had a whole bunch I wanted to go through, and I'm going to save some of those for next week, but I do want to show you a couple of those. And this is something that, again, like I said earlier, not to soft sell you, but I like to see my service as something that, number one, pays for itself, and that goes back to like the Waddles from, what's the name of that book, The Science of Getting Rich. If you provide more in use value than you take in money value, I think he said it a little bit more eloquently than that, then you'll do very well. You will have a successful business. So that's kind of my mantra. It's like, okay, let me let me make sure you get your money's worth. And how can you get your money's worth? And in not being just a tip sheet, you also get some ancillary ideas. Okay. So I think the Russian dolls and possibly opening gap reversals. And I did have one to show you on CPE, and I'll save that for next week. But I think that's where you can get some added value. So just one example recently was on the Landry list was Coinbase. And this is the list I published every day for the upcoming day. And this is obviously a tracking sheet over here with the official recommendations. But there are some other ideas that I show over here. And anything that's clicked off is a short. By the way, it'd be kind of fun to go in and look at these banks now and see what they were doing. We tried to short this fifth third forever. It's probably imploded since we stopped trying to short it. Anybody ever short that? Anyway, so coin was in there. And the Russian doll is basically just a pattern within the pattern. So here we had like a big picture cup and handle type of pattern. And it was also a first thrust. And I think it, I don't think it was a bow tie, but it might've been a bow tie too, but it's definitely a first thrust. So what we're doing is we're not position trading here. We're looking to take an intraday trade. But Dave, I thought you talked about not day trading. Well, I probably day trade a little too much, but I'm here anyway. And if you have a job where you have the luxury of being able to look at a computer, in place an order or two and i'm not saying stare at that screen all day long although i am kind of guilty my shoulders are tight right now my upper back is kind of aching a little bit so i know i spent too much time on screen but if, if you could just plan out something like this where you have a big picture pattern behind you many 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 years ago i knew a day trader and he would look at weekly charts and monthly charts and all these huge charts and do all this analysis. And then I don't, I wouldn't say he's scalping, but pretty much close to scalping. Then he'd go in and just get one little piece, but he made sure he had as much stack behind him as possible. And this is probably kind of helping me along the lines of thinking with the Russian doll. So anyway, you got a daily setup. And then what I did was I bought during this late day breakout and i'm just using a simple breakout you could have a trigger i would say maybe right below the prior day's high just in case people have it above okay like your longer term pullback players might have and look to try to capture an intraday trend now on this one if memory serves i put my order in i put my trailing stop order in and then i put my ipt in and it all kind of unfolded fairly nicely and I was very hands off. And that's the ideal intraday trade. Now notice I only did 100 shares, okay? And this is on a, I think this account is roughly like 100K. This is the same one I use with the service. So I do a lot of the service stuff in this account. If I show you something, I'm willing to do it myself is the point I'm trying to make. 
And how did this one turn out? So we exited market on close. So that's the, that's the goal. Ideally, you want to ride it all day long, but this trade worked out nicely to where we rode it all afternoon. That's a 15-minute bar. So it was three points and eight cents times 50 shares, buck 54, $154. And then on the remainder, it was 5.99. So much better than a poke in the eye if you could pick up a little trade like that. Now here's one that I played day before yesterday. And this one was a little too squirrely, a little too crazy to trade as a position trade. I don't know what the HV on this thing is, but I think it's like 162 or something crazy. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I think it's like 162.45. <laughs> but you can see it did have a nice accelerated uptrend and it did pull back. And to me, it looked like at the least it was getting ready to pop higher in the direction of the trend. In other words, a little bit of a reversion to the mean type of pop was due. So it came in and it opened a little weak, but then it began to rally like crazy. So I said, you know what, Dave? Let's put in an entry up here. And if it keeps rallying, I'm gonna go ahead and get in. Now, this is a great example of entering on the first 15 minute bar. I get this question all the time. People are like, why do you beat the dead horse? Like, cause I keep getting the same questions. <laughs> and you people not, you people here, but you people don't listen. <laughs> you know? Anyway, some people do listen. But the thing is, you have to be willing to take a trade early in the day. Now, it pains me sometimes to buy that high tick on the first 15 minute bar. And I'm like, oh, you big dummy. If you just waited 15 minutes, if you just slept in, whatever, you would have missed this losing trade. But sometimes, most of the move can be made in very, very early trading. If you sit around, sit around, sit around, sit around, waiting for a certain amount of time to pass, you're going to miss those moves. Now, I had an IPT up here, and if memory serves, it was a half a point. And you can see that in this particular case, it did kind of look like a fake out in early trading. And maybe I would have been better waiting a little while but it sure looked like it was going to go straight up i got stopped into it got the initial profit target and then stopped out what was interesting about this one was i remember triggering in and it kind of me entering on sideways and i went for a walk or i did something for a while i got i think it's the only time i got out of the office in like the last two weeks and i got an alert on my phone i'm like oh crap probably just got stopped out of something, you know, with the luck lately. And then I realized that, oh, this thing actually hit the initial profit target. And because I had a order on the remainder, it just stopped out. So basically here was a day trade where I wasn't looking at the screen all day long. I just put it on, let it unfold and took it off. And I grabbed a downloaded spreadsheet. So that was two days ago on the 13th. And I just did a thousand shares on this particular account, and it netted 450 bucks. That's better than a poke in the eye, okay? Uh, 450 a day, what's that? That's uh, like $112,000 a year if you do that every day. Of course, you're gonna have losses though, so that's, you can't just say that you're always gonna make that. But as you can see, it pays sometimes to put the bigger picture behind you, go in and do an intraday trade, use a stop to enter, Use a trailing stop to protect you and use a limit order for your IPT. Now, here is one that I talked about in Facebook when you guys were talking about trades. So I talked about it here. Reason we have this blanked out is not everyone in the Facebook group is a member of the trading service, and we're working on that. We'll we'll fix that longer term. So I went with the AUUD is like the ATOS. It was set up super risky stock. By the way, one thing that I really want to flesh out over time is, is how to pick the best ones of these for intraday trading. I keep trying to stop saying the word day trading, but intraday trading. 
And one thing I've seen them notice is, and I know you guys who day trade a lot are probably saying, duh. But one thing I've seen to notice that you, is that you really have to have a lot of volume and a lot of liquidity. And something like the ATOS and the AUD fit the bill. So anyway, most everything I show you as I preach, I like to make sure that I've mentioned it before I got in. And we were talking trades. When was this? Yesterday. And I said I liked it above 550. So let's take a look at that. And this again was on the Landry list. So 550 right about here. And I put in a stop entry and I went about my life. And it came dangerously close to triggering. And then it sold off, sold off, sold off, sold off. This thing really imploded. Now you can see why this is probably a little too volatile for position trading. That's a 25% move lower, if the math in my head is correct. So to that, I say, thank you, baby Jesus. Eight pound, 12 pounds, baby Jesus. Now, all kidding aside, the reason I wanted to show you this example, and I actually had a losing example too, and we'll, I'll show you that next week. <laughs> Isn't it funny? I didn't have time to squeeze in the loser. <laughs> but I will, I promise. When, when I do the live presentation, I'm like, and now I'm going to show you something that a guru's never shown. And the whole audience wakes up and, you know, <laughs> They sit up in their seats and then I'm like, a losing trade. And I'll show you some losing trades next week. Don't worry about that. But anyway, the reason I want to show you this was something as simple as waiting for an entry. Not every time, not all the time. Believe me, I bought the high tech more than I care to admit. Okay, just bad luck, right? When that happens. But every now and then, and, and actually quite often, using an entry above the market will keep you out of trouble. And it kind of reminds me of, I saw a recent quote from Michael Jordan and paraphrasing him, he said that there would be a lot more professional basketball players if people would just focus on the basics. And I think something as simple as waiting for an entry is one of those basics that not all the time, but quite often can keep you out of trouble. So I want to make sure I show this one here. And here's another case where you put your order in and go about your life. I know easier said than done, and believe me, I watch the screen way too much. I'm not holier than now, but I'm here anyway doing work. So it's it's kind of it's like the like the moth being drawn over to my trade station. I, I keep my trade station on a on a stand up desk, but it's it's a fixed stand up desk, and I'm building a much bigger stand up desk because I don't want to have a trade station where I sit down and before you know it, I'm slouched over that desk all day long i want to at least stand and burn a couple of calories in here now here's some more trading shit <laughs> i'm still hunting the holy grail days and etfs and one thing i was thinking about is i don't really have an answer for you yet okay and, and I might not have an answer, but at least I think over time, I should be able to develop something to where I can avoid markets on certain days. And I'm getting a little bit better, but every day I come in and let's see where it is. I don't have it handy, but every day I come in, I do my analysis and I'll show you a, a chart of what that analysis looks like. And we've talked about it quite before. I've done complete presentations just on that. And seeking out these Holy Grail days. And the Holy Grail day, as I've said quite a bit, it starts at one end and ends at the other. So market opens up and just gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Just trends all day long, one way or the other. It doesn't matter. And if you're trading inverse ETFs and regular ETFs, uh, leveraged ETFs, you could do quite well on those Holy Grail days. And knock on wood, when I go back in and do my research and see a Holy Grail day, and I'll go pull up that day in my trading account, at least the one that's most active, almost always I make a lot of money or at least some money on a Holy Grail day. Unfortunately, the reason I call them a Holy Grail day is they're few and far between and they can be a little elusive. And in the meantime, you kind of grind it out and you could lose a lot of money grinding it out. So if I could just figure out only when to trade when those Holy Grail days are due, meaning that expansion and volatility is due, I would own the world. One thing I kind of backed into this weekend, this weekend, this week, and maybe late last week, I'll have to look at my records, but 
on usually like on Wednesday is a good day to start looking at options. And just by accident, I started looking at options and these ETFs. And I've done okay, but I think it's something that can be, I think it's something that can be very dangerous and I think you have to tread lightly. And I'll flesh this out over time that I was talking with some of you guys in the Facebook group. Basically with an option, you really only have to ask yourself one question. Now I know people have models and implied volatility and all this other good stuff. And that's fine. And I think if you're more of like an engineering type and you like to noodle with things, I think that's fantastic. Maybe you could figure out something there. But for the rest of us, I think the only question you need to ask is can this option move far enough between now and expiration to make trading it versus the underlying worthwhile? And I don't have my notes close to me now, but on some of these things, the intrinsic value of the option, meaning let's say intrinsic, let's just use round numbers here, okay? Let's say the stock is at 11 and the 10 options are trading at a dollar and four cents or a dollar and five cents or whatever. Well, you're only paying a very little bit of money on top of what that option is definitely worth. It's definitely worth intrinsic, unless you wait until the last two minutes of expiration and then you have to dump it less than intrinsic, which I've been guilty of having to get out at all costs to avoid being exercised on the option and carrying a position. But anyway, if you look at it and you figure out how much fluff you have to pay, what's the premium on that option? And when I'm saying premium, I'm talking about the the extrinsic, okay? What in addition to the intrinsic are you paying for the option? Now, the other thing to realize too is obviously if you are buying an option that's deep in the money, you're putting up more money and you could lose a lot more money should things go wrong, you not use stops, et cetera. And by use stops and options, I mean, be willing to get out when they start going to get you. So there is a trade-off in how far out of the money that you wanna go, but usually you wanna try to stay close to at the money or a little bit in the money if you're trying to capture one of these gamma plays, okay? And I don't want to show you how little I know about options, but I did work with a hedge fund for about 10 years that traded options exclusively. And I picked up a little bit through osmosis. I was just doing a technical analysis, but we did have a saying, gamma gets you. Gamma is the rate of change of delta. Delta is how the stock trades relative to the underlying. So if it has a delta of, let's just say 100, make life easy, it trades like 100 shares of stock. So if the stock goes up one point, the option goes up one point, right? An at-the-money option, fun fact, has a delta of 50, okay? So if the stock goes up one point, the option will only go up a half a point, okay? But that delta, the rate of change of delta, the gamma changes really quickly. So if you don't understand all that, just know that there's a chance for the short dated options. And Wednesday into Thursday is kind of the sweet spot with these options that are expiring on a weekly basis where you might be able to go in and use options as a substitution for stock or as in one case, and I think I have the example here, I kind of doubled up on my position by putting on some options because I thought they were worth while. I certainly, in, another question to ask yourself with options is, would you sell that option to someone knowing you had unlimited gains? It's like, no way. If you're thinking no way, then maybe you want to be a buyer. Now, the Holy Grail research, I've done two or three presentations just on this. I don't want to bore you too much on this. I know, too late. But this is this should excite you. If I could figure this out, I don't know the world. But basically, we're looking for these Holy Grail days like this one right here on the 13th. And this is in... Lab D, I believe. Yeah, this is in Lab D. And we did have one and some other ETFs recently too. 
And what I'm doing is I'm looking at how many days it's been since we've had one, okay? And again, it starts at one end and ends at the other, or it never goes much below where it begins the day, okay? And ideally, it's a wide range bar and ends at the end. Now, in some cases, it might not end at the end, but if it rallied enough, then you should be able to make money on the wide range bar. So what I'm doing, this is kind of Toby Crable type of stuff. What I'm looking for is looking for a compression and volatility. I also use a multiple volatility screen, which I'll show you next week. But you can see we had a narrow range bar, a narrow range bar. These are narrow, four day narrow range bars. And then we had a 10 day narrow range bar. And then this is a 20 day high. So this broke out to 20 day highs after compressing and volatility. Now I haven't, I don't have it all figured out, right? Okay. But I'm working on it and I'm trying to figure out a way to, to not trade these things. It's kind of just the opposite of what I guess a novice would think. A novice would be think, I want to trade, I want to trade, I want to trade, be thinking that. And someone who's been around a while, who has grown to detest losses, if that's the right word, is trying to figure out when not to trade. And if I could figure it out when not to trade, obviously I would own the world. So that's why I'd call them Holy Grail days. But I'm working on it and I'll share what I find as I find. So I grabbed a snapshot from a more active account and I traded Drip, LabD, and Sox S. So you could see here that the ETFs were favoring the bear side and that was on when was that on that was on the 14th okay so that was just yesterday wow it seems like a year ago <laughs> it's crazy and what i'm doing here i just want to show you that you don't have to go crazy you know a thousand shares of something like drip or Sox S and maybe just 400 shares would be plenty of something like Lab D. Lab D, you need about a point, okay, based on the volatility. So if you flat out lose, you're losing $400, and you know that 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 hurts, okay. If you lose $400 every day, that's $100,000 a year, right? But as long as you keep your risk in line and hopefully you get a little bit of move in your favor, you won't be you won't lose that entire. $400. Believe me, it happens. Okay. Spell to sign on SH. <laughs> I don't know why I had to say that now. I've been saying shit throughout this presentation. <laughs> anyway, long story endless. You'll notice I've got some options trades in here. And these are just experiments. Okay. And when I was looking at these lab Ds, and I'll get the exact time for you next week so we can see what the intrinsic was at the time. But that's one thing that I started doing lately is writing down the intrinsics when I buy these things. But the intrinsic was pretty close to like a half a point or something. And if you were to, if you were to go in and trade this, as I just said, even just for one day, you're going to need at least a one point stop. And sometimes it's a little bit, you need a little bit more than that. So if you can go in and get an option as a substitution for stock for less than one point, much less than one point, and it doesn't have too much fluff in it, then, I mean, I'm such a nerd. This is so exciting to me. And I know everybody's eyes are probably glazing over. But if you can find an option that you're not paying up much for it, and I don't remember exactly which one it was, but there was one I was paying four cents premium. I'm like, are you crazy? Why would someone sell an option for that cheap? And then you got to ask yourself, well, maybe it's maybe they're trying to unload it and maybe you, you shouldn't be buying it. But to me, it just seemed like, it was kind of a no-brainer. Now I didn't print money on that on this little position here, but I was able to pick up a little bit on the trade. And I, is this all of this for this? I'll have to add add these numbers up. I may not have put in this trade here, okay? But I know in this options trade, I think it made a little bit, but you can see it did make money on the day overall. And I'll check my math on everything to make sure it's correct. But you can see bought the lab D at 22.20. I flipped it out for what? One point. I was looking for one point, one point stop. Then by the end of the day, 23.60. So yeah, so that should be $200 plus another $200, $210, $240 on that. So yeah, that's not included in this number. So this number should be a little bit bigger. 
But even at 900, you know, if you could make an extra $900 a day, I'd be pretty happy. All right, I feel like I've pontificated enough. <laughs> Hope you have recovered from your recent adventures. Yellowstone was a good show, especially the first seasons. Season. Yeah, we've been enjoying it. It's it's something to do, you know. And I work too much, you know. <laughs> I shouldn't have a laptop out three hours a night, you know. It's stupid. It's probably why I have so many repetitive use injuries. All right, Stuart says, my newbie trader friend always insists on trying to buy the low of the day and sell later in the day in hopes to gain four to five percent. If his trading fails, he turns his strategy to a long-term trade. I know, sad. Yeah, you or somebody else was bringing, bringing that up. Now, I have been guilty, truth be told, and I think I did it with CPE not too long ago. I did CPE for day trade, which I wanted to show you tonight on an opening gap reversal, and I'll, I'll show you that next week. I have to go back and watch this. When I edit this, I'll make a list of things to show you. But if you go in, it's I think it's okay if you go to do an add-on trade and you decide to flip it out at the end of the day for a day trade. But it's very dangerous to go in and do a day trade and if it doesn't work, hang on, okay? Now, if you are, let me talk out of both sides of my mouth. If you are possibly trading something like these options we just talked about then let's say the option gets away from you and it's pretty much worthless then i and i've only been doing this for a short period of time with with these particular options but i've done it with many other options before i think it's okay to carry them overnight for instance let's say that i only spent what two hundred dollars in change on those options that i just showed you not that you want to lose $200 a day, but let's say it gets away from you or whatever, you can't cash out by the end of the day or you know, it implodes and by the time you get your order in, it's too late because options are tricky, right? Then it's okay to maybe hold those options overnight. They're only worth like 10 cents or whatever. It's like, what do you get, 40 bucks? You know, it might be worth holding them overnight. If you get stopped out, you get stopped out. But yeah, very dangerous game to... And, and I think it was you, Stuart, that was talking about that in the Facebook group where he's got this huge portfolio with all these stocks. And and believe me, I had on, I don't know, but it started today, I had on, I forget how many positions and I got knocked out of the three or four today, at least, or three. And it was a really ugly day, but fortunately, a lot of that was just open profits. And I know, easier said than done. It could be, it could be quite traumatic because, and that's another thing that I want to touch upon tonight, but just ran out of time, is there's a bit of an endowment effect where you you mentally monetize all that money. And like one of you guys, I think it was John Z was saying, whenever he feels like going buy a new car, he said from now on, he's going to start selling down on his positions. Okay, let's take a look at the overall market. You guys want to ask about individual stocks, feel free to start doing so right now. I've got a few things I want to flesh out real quick. S&P 500, S&P 500 doesn't look too bad. Like I tell my service peeps tonight and, and then last night, it's like, if you'd have told me the P's are down a third of a percent and last night up a what, you know, whatever, an eighth of a percent, if that much, I said, oh yeah, I probably did okay. And it's like, no, I did not. I got whacked. Now, one thing that I meant to mention and one of, one of you guys uh, texted me today on this, and the answer is yes. It's like, once you see momentum getting hit, usually the market follows suit. As I've said many times before, I was running just research, not actual money. And one day I might do it just for S and Gs, but I was running research where I would had hypothetical million dollars and I had I put 10,000 into 100 stocks, 10,000 into 100 stocks. I think that's right. And I called it Landry 100. And I also treated cash as an asset class. So if I couldn't find 100 stocks and I started getting stopped out and started peeling off stocks, 
then it would go into cash. But anyway, this thing, this thing printed money, like stupid money. And all I was doing for the most part, there was a few caveats, can't give it all away, but for the most part, it's like, I was like, I'm going to keep this to myself. And then I tell everybody, but for the most part, I was just buying new highs, ideally on expansion of a range. Now, if you tried to do that with just a few stocks, what's going to happen? I can almost guarantee you. I knew somebody years ago, I never throw anybody under the bus, but they had a strategy where you would buy new highs on expansion of range. And every now and then it would work, but for the most part, it failed miserably. However, if you do that across 100 stocks, okay, one of them is really going to take off or a few of them will come right back in, but then take off two or three days later. Okay, you get this huge expansion of new highs, and sometimes they follow through, which is really cool. And other times they'll come right back in, but then take off over two or three days. And that makes it a really hard strategy to try to day trade or short term trade because the market's up 10%, the stock's up 10%, you pile in, and then the next day it's down 10%, and then you exit. And then, of course, the next day after that, it's up 20 or 30%. But anyway, long story endless, the point I was trying to get to is one of the amazing things that I kind of backed into by, quote unquote, running this model portfolio was that this thing would get whacked like 3%, sometimes 4%. And there was a hedge fund that was kind of interested in it for a while, and, and it never did get off the ground. I don't think they could stomach the volatility, and it would be a crazy volatile thing maybe in my next life this might be something to run for fun hire a kid and have him do the research and then we just you know put the trades in at the close but again this thing would get whacked right before usually two or three days before the market itself will get whacked you can almost time off of it and the 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 thing that the client was asking me earlier today was like hey dave you're seeing the small caps get hit right i'm like yeah he's like doesn't that mean the overall market's going to follow suit? And it usually does. So long story endless, even though the S&P is doing pretty good in here, I'm a little nervous about what's happening with the small cap stocks. And we'll get to the Russell in particular. Now, when you look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ paints a little bit more true a picture, at least on a short, 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 short time frame. You can see the NASDAQ was down... Uh, about three quarters of a percent today, off its worst levels, but still down about three quarters of a percent. Now, longer term looks pretty good. Let's throw some moving averages in. And you can see we just barely tagged the 20 EMA. In fact, that's a system in and of itself. And I like it. To, I like them to tag the 30 now even better. But I think if all you did, you know, write this down, find a market that's got 20, 30 days of Landry Light or even 10 days of Landry Light. And wait for it to come down to tag the 20 or the 30. My Cajun just looked up, come down there, to come down there to the 30. <laughs> and then look to get in above that high or however you want to trade that pullback. I think you would do okay. It's another one of those basic things that I think works pretty good. Now, getting back to the market, the Rusty, even though it was only down a half percent today, let's just see what it's down for this little. This last little slide is, yeah, so it's down over six and a quarter percent during this last little slide. So that's a pretty serious slide for an index, if you think about it. So HV is what, 19? So if you're trading stocks with HVs of 60 or 70 or 80 or even 100 or more like we have been lately, you're going to get whacked a lot more than 6% on a slide like that, believe me. But we have bow tie down in here. We kind of had like a micro first thrust, if you squint your eyes. But now's a little bit more official signal in the works. And all it would take would be a little bit of a bounce to complete this bow tie to the downside. Remember, all we're looking for is a crossing of all three moving averages fairly quickly, okay? And then at least a one bar pullback. So keep an eye on the rusty to see if it breaks down. Now, if it begins to rally above the moving averages, then I would not be as concerned about the signal. And in fact, as I've been saying quite often, especially in the service, if we have a really big, big, big up day or a couple of big up days, it would kind of negate all this bearishness. But it does pay to pay attention for when the market is becoming a little iffy. 
especially with the sector action, as we're going to get into in just one second. I was thinking right as or right before we went live, somebody on YouTube, and I don't think they would be in friendly, but um, that's fine. I'd, I'd rather somebody comment, you know, just comment. That's fine with me. But I think it was in one of my stock charts shows, Trading Simplified is a show I do over there. Somebody said, every time you get cautious, or I don't think they use the word bearish, but every time you get cautious, I make money. And that'll work until it don't, you know, and, and I, I hear him and I know what he's saying. So what he's saying is I get a little concerned when the market begins to roll over and the market goes straight back up. Well, that's because the market was just correcting and then it took off. And if you're in a longer term bull market, it'll do that a lot of times. But if you are to be a trader, you have to start paying attention to these signals, even though you will occasionally be frustrated. As Greg Morris says, talking about market timing and getting out of the way during a bear market, bear markets are devastating, whipsaws are frustrating. You could survive frustration, okay? But devastation is a different thing, and that's why I believe in timing the markets. Okay, Craig says, compare the IWF to the IWM, growth versus all the IW. All right, good uh, good analysis. You know, I wish I had time. There are so many. Uh, oh, look at that. So that's, that's see, that's kind of shocking to me that the growth is doing that well compared to the overall Russell 2000. So... That should be quite interesting. Oh yeah, speaking of Greg, I noticed that I was looking for a certain thing that I was gonna use in a presentation and I couldn't find it exactly. I'm trying to think what I was looking for in his blogs, but I stumbled across some of his blogs over at Stock Charts and I don't know if he's done any in a while. His son is, I think, kind of taken over. His son's running money, uh, similar to the way he did, I believe. But anyway, I, he had an article about frustration versus devastation, which kind of talks about uh, which talks about the fact that if you lose half of your money, you're going to be devastated. But if you get whipsawed out for let's say 10% or whatever, something like the TFM 10% system, you can survive that. You can survive that frustration. Craig says we take all signals. Yeah, that's a that's a quote from Greg Morris. And back when he was running $5 billion, if they had a sell signal based on their analysis, their in-depth analysis, looking at, I guess, uh, quite a few things. I don't know exactly how he does it. I've got his book here, but I, I do things a little bit more simpler than that. But I would encourage you to read it, Investing with the Trend. And I probably should reread it. There's a lot of good stuff in there. But yeah, he, you know, we take all signals. So yeah, good point, Craig. Uh, the IWF looking a lot better than IWM. I would, if you're interested in that type of analysis, I would watch like Dave Keller's show and I wish he would get back live. And they keep threatening to go back live, but I think they're getting there. Uh, but he has a show called The Final Bell. And, and once he goes back live, I could promise you, I'm gonna watch that every day live. So give, I'm, give him a little shout out, give him a little plug. And he does that type of analysis where you're comparing, you know, intermarket technical analysis, things like that. So that's an interesting thing, Craig. I'm glad you brought that up. And that's maybe something I need to explore a little further. All right, let me just go through a few more of these and then we'll get to your questions and stock picks. So one thing that is a little bit concerning is take a look at the energies. The energies have begun to break down in here, down a little bit more than one and a half percent. I think I said last night to serve is kind of a micro first thrust, kind of a or a pioneer first thrust as I call them, kind of a micro cup and handle. But now we're almost to a bow tie down. Let's just confirm that to see where we are. Okay, 10 is at 1064. Yeah, so we're not quite, but almost. So I would say tomorrow, as long as we stay below this moving average, those moving averages will cross over and catch up. And then we could see a sell signal really quick on the first little bounce in the energies. Now, metals and mining have been kind of bouncing back a little bit in here, and they're almost back above the 30. If they're back above the 30, then maybe they'll be okay. Not that that's a line in the sand, but it does give you a reference point. But you can see the moving average is still in downtrend proper order. So, so far, 
metals and mining look like they're still in trouble. Ivan Bearish on the banks. What did that FITB do? I bet that son of a biscuit eater has imploded, right? This was one we watched forever. Eh, it didn't really imploded. I mean, that's a short side, you know? Goes down a little bit, then it goes up a little bit. This was one we had as a bow tie forever. Finally gave up on it. Of course, it's going to implode. None of them have given up on it. But the banks, before I digress too far, imagine that, me digressing. Downtrend proper order. And downtrend meaning proper order, meaning the 10 is less than 20, is less than 30. If you look at the, if I could, I don't know if I could pull it up on a fly or not, but if you look at the ACP platform, now I know I've showed this before, but it could be a, a, a handy dandy little, little thing to do. A lot of this stuff, like if I show you indicators on a chart and all, I just kind of use my mind's eye a lot of times on these things. But spiders, that's fine. We'll use the spiders. And I don't know how to share these. I asked the powers at B how to share, and, and they haven't gotten back with me. They're incredibly busy over there. But like if we put in the proper order, okay, on the bow ties, and you're looking at something like the S&P 500, and I've done the Tarzan speak speeches before, but green good and red bad and yellow could go either way right well if you look at the s p 500 we had a little yellow right here because they had a little bit of a crossing but for the most part we've been green for a long long time a couple of cautions in between what is this way back here is that back where we were doing that analysis okay this is not a good time for trend trading okay because it didn't follow through so we take a look at like the Russell, let's see where we are there. Okay, so now we're in the red zone, okay? So that could be, it's not the end of the world, right? Because you're not that far away from the moving averages. Don't rush out and go crazy, but think about what could possibly happen here. And another thing, just real quick, you could also use even simpler than the bow ties, obviously would be to use the proper water I'm sorry, use the the Landry light, which is right here. This is a plugin that you can get for free. You get it down here. If you're watching on YouTube, all you have to do is like the video and then you are eligible for a free plugin. How does that work? It's it's amazing how it works. I don't know, but it's pretty cool. You have to like the video first. If you don't like what I'm doing, go have no fun somewhere else. I'm half kidding. So Another thing to help keep in the right side of the market, again, Landry Light 30A EMA, one of my favorite EMAs now. I know you probably want to party with me, but you can see Landry Light is just lows or greater than the moving average for uptrends and less than the moving average for downtrends. So when it's flipping back and forth, you can see that's a choppy market, okay? But now we're beginning to get a little red to the downside. Okay, you're bringing up some good points in here, guys. Let's see what you're saying. Okay, XLE has bow tied down. Okay, let's take a look at XLE. XLE is, we were talking about energies a second ago. Let's put in the bow ties with the proper order. Yeah, so see, you've got red right now. So that has crossed over to the downside. That's how we all got started. Thank you for bringing me back to where we were or where I was. But yeah, you're downtrend proper order. A little bit of a sloppy bow tie because you have a lot of green in here, okay? But I'm gonna start a lot of red in here. Colorblind tonight. Yellow. <laughs> because it didn't cross very tightly, but it is a bow tie nonetheless. If it crosses over three to four days, that's that's good enough, right? But yeah, the XLE has bow tied down, okay? Um what else would be worth looking at while we have this up? Okay, let me jump back to Telechart and finish up real quick. And by the way, I use a lot of, as I've said a thousand times, I use a lot of tools in my business. I think you just saw me use Metastock and then Telechart and then Stock Charts ACP. And one thing good about Stock Charts, just to give them a free plug, I don't get anything from it, believe me, is that. Um, they are being very accommodating and, and, and getting more and more of my stuff in their platform, such as historical volatility and uh, Landry Light and the Bowtie Proper Order and all that stuff. So just to give them a shout out, very thankful to what they're doing over there. All right, insurance, as you can see, downtrend proper order, a little bit of opening gap reversal today. Still looks like a big picture top 
remains in place there. Drugs, which had been big on new highs, have now begun to loss, lose steam. So we go back about a month and change, and we're down a little bit over one and three quarters percent. So this is a little bit concerning. We're almost below that 30 EMA. So if you're looking at daylight or Landry light, as we now call it, we no longer have upside Landry light on there. Not the end of the world, hasn't rolled over just yet, but certainly losing some steam. Biotech, a little bit different story. Biotech broke out above these prior highs in here. It looked like it was going all the way back to its old highs. And what happens? It rolled right back over. And we could get a bow tie back down. I wouldn't take this as a sell signal in and of itself. But if you're maybe trading in intraday ETFs or something, you say, okay, well, the trend's behind me. So how do I want to play that? Do I want to try to pay, play that lab D? Or do I want to maybe, if this thing gets real over, so maybe play a bounce in the lab U? And then look at all those other volatility indicators we talked about earlier. Health services still looks pretty good. And today's move just looks like a little bit of a knockout move, trend knockout type of thing, TKO. So um, put that one in the not so bad column, as they say in letter kidding, not so bad. <laughs> Leisure, okay, look at that. Bow tie, oh, tiny I was just slipped out. Look at that. Uh, Bow ties are in downtrend proper water. It's banging out new lows in here. I wouldn't call that a trend, but it looks like it's kind of rolling over. It looks like it's still in trouble. Retail on the upside still looks pretty good, right? Nice little uptrend. Bow tie proper order. Landry light on 30. Yay, it looks great. Okay, back to the downside. Transports. Okay, not looking so hot in here. So the point I'm trying to make is the market is mixed, and a lot of areas could be in trouble so i think now's the time to pay attention you know now and, and i hope i'm wrong you know now is one of those times where maybe you'll make a lot of money because especially that one gentleman says he always makes money when i'm cautious okay maybe now's the time where the market is just shaking everybody out i know i'm pretty shaken right now and then it's gonna go right back up but i think it pays to pay attention now take a look what happened in the semis today, you can see selling off fairly hard, closing below the 30 EMA, not the end of the world, but it does give you a little bit of a reference. And you can see if it closes much lower, then we've definitely given up all of this little recent breakout in here. So that's a little bit of concern. Let's just take a look at bonds real quick, and then we'll open it up for individual stocks. If you would have told me back earlier this year that bonds would be higher than they were, or if you told me back in February and March that bonds would start going up, I would have looked at you like a pooch pants, right? <laughs> Especially if you factor in inflation and all these other great things that are happening. I'm being facetious, obviously, but or sarcastic. I forget which one that would be. But hey, what is is bonds are going up, rates are going down, you know. And I'm, I saw an ad right before it went live. Rates are going up. And I'm like, no, they don't, Danny. <laughs> So you got to believe in what you see and not in what you believe. You got to be careful of putting themes. Will bonds crash eventually? Yeah, I think so. All this will catch up to us, but um, eventually it can be a long time. What are your thoughts on buying an IPO buy at B when it triggers but closes far above the trigger level? CYT, recent example. That's a tough one, Jeff. That is a tough one. So that's a good question. CYT, yeah, I mean, that one's okay. Um, let's take a look at that. Yeah, it's a little tough to buy up here at Nosebleed. And I'm trying to think, I don't know if I bought that one or not. It, it's a discretionary call and it's it's not that easy, but let's take a look. The, the volume's a little light on that one. So I'd be interested to see what the spread would have been. 2103, how high did it get? It got to 2310. So you could have gotten two points out of that. That would have been tough to do, but it might have worked out. But yeah, I don't have a definitive answer for you. The other thing too is this is kind of a neat situation where the range on here is way too small to trade this as a buy at B. But on day, whatever day that is, day six or seven, when it finally triggers, the range expands. So now you have enough range. 
So I think it's okay to take like this particular one. I think it's okay to take, and it's kind of one of those scary trades to take. I've seen them a lot more extreme than this, and I've been very nervous about taking them when they do that, okay? So this particular example in and of itself, I think it's okay because you finally got the range you needed. But yeah, that's something that is a discretionary call, and sometimes you just have to let them go. But there have been, there have been times where I get in these things extended like this right before the weekend, and as soon as I hit enter and a ding, 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 the bell goes off. I'm like, what in the hell did I just do? But many times, not all the times, many times I've been pleasantly surprised. So it's going to be a judgment call. What I would suggest you do, bring them up in Facebook. Let's noodle with them a little bit if there's time before the close. And let's take them on a case-by-case -case basis. But yeah, um, so a couple of you guys are already in that. That's cool. Yeah, let's see how it shakes out. It's not the end of the world just yet, but it looks so far so good. Take a look at Bond as a buy at B, B-O-N, B-O-N. Okay. Yeah, this looks kind of, this started out with a lot of volume, but then started dying out a little bit. Okay, so what's the low here? The low is six round numbers. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. So your trigger technically would have been on that day there. Uh, I could, I probably wouldn't have bought that just because the, the the tail is too crazy, okay? And were you actually above the day one high on that day? Let's see where you were. So buy it B, you're looking to buy on the first closing high in the IPO with a boatload of caveats. Go in and watch the last week of charts I did. I think it was called trading in a word. And the word is patience, spoiler alert. I think I talked a lot about it, about buy D and that one. And I've done it plenty of presentations. And obviously behind the firewall is a whole plethora of stuff. And if you don't want to sift through all that, get the IPO course. <laughs> I think I gave you the IPO course as a as a member eventually. So that's a, a mem uh, something to make you help you stay a member. Okay, high of 1053. And the close was, yeah, it was well above the, that. Yeah, so technically that would have been your buy right there. So far it's worked out. Uh, I did not personally buy this one. I don't remember whether I saw it or not, or if I saw it and decided against it. But that's a that's an interesting situation. And a lot of stuff I developed in IPOs in 2014, I think is when I did the course. All of it still works nicely, which is very exciting. But the markets have gotten a lot more volatile. A lot more people have gotten interested in IPOs, and you got your Reddit boys, and you got your phone traders, and your stay-at-home husbands and wives. So yeah, that's a tough call. So I don't, I actually don't have an answer for you on that one. But technically, it did trigger on that day there. And if you survive this slide, you're you're doing okay. But that's a tough one, okay? I passed, of course, now it rebounds. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a tough thing. Well, the other thing you could do, and this is not a perfect example, but keep in mind that with the buy at B, you're, you're a pioneer back here somewhere. What you can do is you can let it pull back. And again, this isn't a great example, but you could go ahead and play that first pullback. And that's what I did, I think, with Academy, if memory serves is I was looking at it as a buy ID and I just couldn't pull the trigger. And I ended up playing that first pullback and it actually became a service recommendation. The bank, I can't remember the name of it that I stayed in forever. Oh, what's that? EBR, oh, anyway, it was, uh, it might've been an EDR. Anybody remember the bank we were in? We all went after as a buy and B. Anyway, there was a bank that was really hard for me to go after for a buy, as a buy ID. But EBC, thank you. Yeah, it was a case where I was like, well, I think it's worth a shot. Yeah, way back here, it was an expansion of range. Boy, I'm glad I stopped out of that one, huh? Look at that. But this was a great trend. This was a fantastic play. So if you're a little nervous about the buy at B in something for whatever reasons, you could always wait for your secondary setup, okay? And this one, would have, it would have taken a while for you to get in, but like luckily with ASO, it um, it happened pretty quickly.
What are the chances that TLT's rallying is a response to the traditional equities versus bond concepts when both are actually overpriced? Geez, I don't know, Craig. I mean, you might be onto something as a trend following more on, you know, right now, at least shorter term, they're going up. So that's one of those what is is things. And that's the problem with themes. As I often say, is you won't know the you don't want to won't know the theme until afterwards. I certainly didn't know the theme that, hey, buy it was hard for me to buy a brick and mortar IPO academy. It was really hard for me to do that. And uh it worked out nicely, obviously, so far. Knock on wood. Somebody texted me today. I got out of ASO. Should I have gotten out? I was like, what does it say in the service? <laughs> no, not yet. You might be right, but you just micromanage. Anyway, I digress. But it was hard for me to buy. And now I know why I went up because it turned out to be a, a theme. You know, people are people are sick of being stuck in their houses. They want to go buy a kayak car. They want to buy some activewear and get their butts outside. So yeah, I don't know, Craig. Uh, you might be onto something. If you want to flesh that a little further, we can noodle with it in the Facebook group. And you know, maybe that's where some of the intermarketetical analysis can come in. And maybe I think you could do it on stock charts. You could do it with uh, Telechart too. But you could plot on Telechart. I think you can do two. You can do a few more on stock charts. Maybe plot a few of these things one under the uh, uh, the other, and and do a little noodling with that. And that's probably something again, just to give uh, Keller a shout out again. That's the kind of stuff he does. Okay. Which speaker are you going to watch every day when he goes back online? I missed his name. David Keller, just said it again. David Keller used to be head of financial. He was the head financial guy for Fidelity, okay? So I think he knows his stuff. He's been around a block a time or two. XLE, yeah, we talked about that. John, are you being serious? Don John is saying F. We used to have someone here who would ask about F and I'd have to kick him out when it wasn't trending. Uh, F looks like it, it's in trouble. It's probably uh, it's probably Don as an alias, but it looks like it could be rolling over. I don't see a setup there. And even if you had a short, it's got a lot of supply down here. So neither, neither long or short. Lawrence says he listens to him too. Yeah, I don't listen to him that much just because I never get around to it. And by the time he comes on, I'm already done with my analysis if if I'm working hard to get done. So, I mean, I'm here 12 hours a day anyway, at least. And I don't want to, I'll be here another 13 if I wait for the, the recording of the show, 14 to come on. But I'd love to um, listen to him live just to gain a little perspective. M-I-M-E? M-I-M-E? Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, the only thing that I don't like is I like stocks that are kind of into new high territory without having this prior little peak in here like that. So that would probably uh, have me eliminate it. And in my momentum list, I've got a few of these that look okay. If the volatility is super duper high, then it's okay to have a pattern like this. You just kind of trade off of this leg here. But volatility on this thing is like 25, which is pretty low. In fact, right now, I'm, my cutoff's are right around 30. I'm not trading stocks below 30. Yeah, EBC was the bank we were doing. Yeah, EBC. Yeah, there it is. Kind of a persistent move lower, huh? So it's like, you know, this was good, right? Tarzan be good and all bad. I mean, too bad it's not always that easy. <laughs> You know, there's your lesson in persistency. If all you did was found stocks that just kind of grind their way higher and got long them, and when they started grinding lower, get out, you'd own the world, right? Yeah, y'all remember Don? <laughs> I kicked him out like really serious one time and um, kind of half kidding. And uh, that was the last we saw of him. He's probably under alias. He's probably on John John now that he's. Yeah, he left. He left after. Uh, so that was probably Craig. I mean, uh, Craig, that was probably Don. Well, Don made an appearance. All right. Now we can talk about it. Now he's left. 
I need to channel Tarzan. Yeah, you know, that's the bottom line. And, and I may, I joke about things like this, but you'd be surprised how much Tarzan speak could, could really help you out in the markets, you know? Tarzan speak, bad. Tarzan speak, good, you know? As opposed to saying, oh, well, I think that banks are going to do okay. People at home and banking online. And, you know, before you know it, you're saying all these different things. Hey, so far, 10 bucks on TLT. You got 10 bucks on TLT? Good for you. Yeah, Tarzan speak good, right? <laughs> so far, at least. Pretty impressive rally, if you think about it. It's up 10. Yeah, it's up 10. Gotcha. All right, anything else? Oh, geez, I'm out of time. Oh, geez, as we say in Fargo. Oh, just leave somebody's question. I'm sorry. Uh, bring it to the Facebook group or bring it next week. All right, uh, I'm out of time. As usual, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I'm very humbled by you guys showing up. It looks like we broke a record for not advertising. So uh, thank you so much for finding the show. I know it's been difficult. If you can't find a show, I'll put a link in in post for our next couple of years. You're welcome, Paul. You're welcome, John. Everybody have a fantastic night. If we don't talk again between now and then, have a good weekend, and then I'll see the rest of you guys and girls in the Facebook group. Thank you so much.